All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Duckman TV for another episode uh, with Troy Warner from the Paracade Podcast. Troy, how are you going? I'm going fantastic, Duckman. It's been a while since we've chatted. A lot of rugby league being played since then, but uh, yeah, no, great round just played in the NRL. Yeah, absolutely. So been a couple of State of Origin games in between two, and the games have gone from being close every single week been some blowouts so i think the last blowout we talked about was uh when the tigers demolished the cowboys <laughs> last time and uh well this weekend haven't we had a change of fortune for round 18 so we'll uh let, let's go back to thursday night sharkies took on uh the dragons and sharkies got up 52 16 so there's been a lot of water under the bridge the last few weeks. So Ryan Carr, what are you making of him taking over from Anthony Griffin in the caretaker role? Oh, look, just before we talk about that, it was obviously uh, Bernie's for Brain Cancer around, uh, yep. Mark Hughes Foundation, and uh, Mark Hughes Foundation doing some great work there um, in the battle for brain cancer research there. So I think you can still get your Bernie's at selected IGAs, uh, also Lowe's and also uh, Mark Hughes Foundation.com.au. But um, so it was great to see the crowds, all the crowds with their beanies on. Um, I was fortunate enough to, on the Monday, be at the launch of that uh, at the SCG and we walked down to the to the Opera House and, um, yeah, it was good to mix amongst some uh, players and uh, celebrities as well. So um, now to the game, St. George and... Cronulla, well, Ryan Carr, well, I think it's been a little bit difficult for him because he's had to inherit the side that um, Anthony Griffin obviously put together. Um, I think he started off not too bad. I think, obviously, the sacking of a coach and the team wins that next round, uh, I think that happened. I think the Dragons got a win there. Um, but I think just the outside noise, the outside dramas and and – Obviously, the Ben Hunt affair has just really sort of taken its toll on the club, and they had the they didn't know who the coach was going to be there for a few weeks, and now got Shane Flanagan in as, in as coach for the next three years, I think it is. Um, look, I, I think he's a he's a good coach, um, but just at a struggling club. Yeah, so he came from the Super League, uh, coached in the Super League. He did play in the NRL too. Uh, Tried to check him out. I don't think he played any first grade games. He played some lower grade games around the traps, uh, Ryan Carr. And I can't remember off the top of my head. I think he was coaching Featherstone Rovers or whatever in the UK. They coached a half decent team, right? Uh, in the Super League. So it, it wasn't one of the top, top level coaches, but he's a developing coach. He's the kind of guy you probably do want to work with. And he looks like he's got a fair bit of potential there in the coaching ranks. Unfortunately, there's stuff going on in the Dragons where they haven't dealt with a board level for somewhere between five to ten years. So the house douse thing is all over and done with now. I got rid of Griffin, so they can't blame him anymore. Though I think they're unfairly blaming him as well. There's a few guys probably got to have a look at what they're doing, and uh, I think they need to bring some new blood in next year. And uh, well, Zach Lomax got told. Over the weekend, he can start having a look for something else somewhere else. So I think Shane Flanagan is making his intentions pretty clear what he wants. I think he wants to have a tough side like he had at the Sharks. Yeah, look, it's a bit of a wishy-washy situation at the Dragons at the moment. I mean, I think we've been told that Zach has been said that uh, the club has said that he'll look for another club. We've had Shane Flanagan say, no, he wants him at the club. So... We don't really know what's happening with Zach Lomax. I mean, he's on a pretty good wicket. I think 800,000, I think. So um, whichever club he goes to, if he goes to another club, we'll have to probably pick up most of that. Um, and that's a pretty big salary. But, uh, look, I think Shane Flanagan will be, is the right answer for coach of the Dragons. You need someone with that hard edge. He's won a premiership before. I think... Um, He'll he'll turn. He's been at the club before as well, um, as an assistant coach and also a, a player way back when uh, he first started playing himself in first grade. I think he only played three games or so for the Dragons, um, but I think he's the right selection out of the coaches that were probably free to coach. I think um, Jason Ryle's knocked it back. 
Um, he obviously didn't want to go down there with what everything was going on. We've still got this Ben Hunt saga going on. I think everyone's probably a little bit sick of hearing about it at the moment. Um, personally, I think he'll probably see out the year and then he'll be he'll be off uh, to somewhere else, uh, probably the Gold Coast Titans. But that's just my personal opinion. I don't have any inside information. But um, Shane wants him to stay at the club um, and lead the club because he's the club's best player. So he's an origin player, represent uh, Australian player. So... He's the club's best player, highest paid player. So they want him there. And I think they just need to sort out their dramas. And once they can sort out their dramas, they can probably transfer that onto the field and then hopefully for their fans and members get some results. Yeah, so that, that's definitely what they need to do. Uh, ben Hunt would be in high demand. So Des Hasler's come out and actually publicly said he'd like Ben Hunt in the team at Gold Coast. So well, wouldn't you? The guy is a champion. He's aiming up in a side that's not fabulous every week, and I don't blame him. So I think Gold Coast, that they're pretty close. They look like they're missing a couple of blokes to be key players in like a fairly good side to be able to take them to the next level. And I obviously didn't think Justin Holbrook could do that, and they've got Desi at the right time. Um, I suppose Ben Hunt would also be on Wayne Bennett's radar and would fit somewhere. If you could get him for the Dolphins, you'd be taking him offshore because they've got guys like Sean O'Sullivan, Isaiah Katoa and all that stuff. But you wouldn't say no to Ben Hunt if he became available for your squad. You, you wouldn't, but, uh, you know, rugby league's a strange game. I think that Dol- I think Wayne Bennett's come out and said that they're not interested in Ben Hunt, <laughs> but uh, it's a strange game, rugby league, so you could never, never say never. And um, who knows, he might end up there, but you're right. I mean, a player of his calibre could go to a club like that and really transform it around. But um, I don't think he'll end up with the Dolphins. As I said, I think he'll end up with the Titans. But yeah. the Sharks, they they're, uh, they were under a little bit of pressure themselves as well, um, losing a few games. And um, obviously, Nico Hines wanted to impress the selectors, New South Wales selectors, to get his spot back for Origin 3. Um, we, I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but obviously he didn't get that spot that he wanted. Um but they really just did blitz him. I think it was the first time in both clubs' history and in, in, in this local derby game that they've scored 50 points. The Sharks have scored 50 points against the Dragons in, in a local derby game. So uh, they really turned it on in front of a pretty much, I think it was like a full house down there at Shark Park. Yeah, that, that's a really big deal. So the Sharks last year, I watched the game they played against the Panthers. I went out, I was trying to think where I was, went out for dinner, um, whatever the place is on the other side of the river there at Panthers, one of those flash eateries that cost me a stack of cash. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. It was just bleeding money out my wallet. Um, <laughs> and I watched Penrith beat the Sharks and they beat them 22-18 or something. I've got to try at the end of the game. And that that's the strongest I've seen Cronulla play, like taking it to someone for a long period. They took it to Penrith all game. Penrith only won it or try in the last couple of minutes. In the end, yeah, they kind of dominated the game, but it was close right to the wire. So I think Cronulla's finding that form again now. I think they're about to click right in the gear and everything's starting to come together for them. I think Craig Fitzgibbon's really instilled some high level of discipline into them this year. Then we're seeing that now. So if they can get around the top four, they're going to be a big chance of uh, having a shot at this title this year, I think. Yeah, I think they find themselves currently in the top four, and I think they've got a buy this week, uh, this weekend, I think. Um, so, yeah, they're slowly coming into that form that we saw them in 2022, uh, where they made the finals, unfortunately went out in straight sets. But uh, they'll be wanting to avenge those straight set losses in the finals, um, and they'll want to be staying around in that top four position because uh, we all know that it's very difficult to win a competition outside the top four. Um, so they want to stay there and um, and have another crack at these finals and obviously hoping to win a competition. Yeah, 100%. Uh, we'll roll on to the next game. So uh, Warriors took on the Rabbitohs. That was on Friday night. And, you know, I thought the Warriors were going to be able to get the job done. I thought Rabbitohs just got too much, too much white noise in the background, too many things going on. And I was a little bit surprised they... Uh, they didn't get the job done. The Rabbitohs came out. Jason Demetrio got his team up and they uh, whacked them 28-6. to six. It was a good win in the end. 
Yeah, look, this game was played in treacherous conditions over there in New Zealand. It was absolutely pouring with rain during the game. Um, so you would have thought that it would have suited the Warriors, uh, but it didn't. Um, there was it was like back to the old days where there was like puddles on the field and, and things like that. We haven't seen those sort of conditions in a long time, but... Um, the Rabbitohs, again, they were a team that had been struggling of late, obviously missing a few stars. Um, Latrell Mitchell has been out for a while now. Jai Arrow is out as well. Um, Cameron Murray played on the weekend, but he'd been out for a couple of weeks as well. So they had mi been missing a few players, and it was a crucial game for them. Uh, they want to stay in contact with that top four. Uh, I think they're currently sitting at seventh, seventh position on the ladder. Uh, they've still got, I think, one one or two buys in hand. So I think it's two. Uh, so they'll want to get up into that top four position again and hopefully Latrell comes back for them and uh, rip into the finals. But uh, Alex Johnston, he became the equal third highest try scorer of all time. Uh, I think he sits on 180 now. Uh, which is equal third on the ladder. So he's slowly climbing that ladder. I think there's, what, 32 tries, I think, to go until he's number one. I think uh, yeah. Ken Irvine scored 212. So his next target is Billy Slater. So he's one of these finishers that probably um, is – he's a safe finisher. So you know he's just going to get the ball down over the line – rather than a flashy finisher, but uh, he can score some great tries. And, look, the Warriors will be tough this week for Parramatta. Um, after that loss, they'll want to get back on the their winning ways. So, uh, yeah, they, they've been playing some really good footy of late, the Warriors. So they'll be disappointed they lost, but they'll want to learn from it and hopefully uh, get a win. Well, not for myself, but uh, hopefully <laughs> for them that they'll get a win next round. Yeah. So I think the Warriors are still in the eight. I haven't had a look at the table at the moment. Look at that after we go for all these games. So I'm pretty sure they they were up near the top four before this game, and dropping that will get them around about seven or eight, or maybe even ninth at the moment because it's pretty tight. You drop yeah, two games in the top four, you could be sitting second at the moment. Drop two games, next thing you know, you're ninth. So yeah, uh, they're sitting in they're still. sitting in eighth position. So they've dropped down a little bit. Uh, they're two points in front of the Cowboys at the moment, who are in ninth. So um, they're they're hanging in there. Uh, but as I said, crucial game for them next week or this week against Parramatta. Yeah. So. I can I can tell you my tips didn't go so well this week before we go too much further. So I actually predicted the Warriors. I thought they would beat uh the Rabbitohs. Yep. And I also predicted the Storm. I thought Storm would beat Pamara. Yep. Uh, <laughs> uh rolled into that one and when I left the radio on Friday night, rolled on down to the bowling club and watched bang, first try Melbourne. Second try Melbourne, it's going, oh, this is going to be ugly. <laughs> and all of a sudden, third try Melbourne, then all parents like, oh, hang on, we're playing. So, and they clicked the gear. I don't know what happened to Melbourne. Uh, Craig Bellamy's head started going red. It looked a bit calm in the first half in the uh, box. In the second half, looked like he had a bad sushi or something at half time. <laughs> and he was raging, didn't look happy. Uh, and Pemriff actually aimed up. They didn't just play oh, a little bit and Melbourne played bad. Melbourne played pretty good. And Pemriff actually came out and then took it up a level. And Melbourne couldn't go with him. And it surprised me because normally Pemriff will only do that if Cleary's out there. So Jack Cogger, I think he's been pretty good since he's come in at the moment. And some of the other guys have been coming through Pemriff too. Spencer Leno and that, who's now near South Wales squad, they've, they've really aimed up when they've needed to. Yeah, look, well, I think um, previous to that, I think Christian Welsh fired them up. I think the Panthers players and especially the Panthers forwards with his little comment about uh, how the Knights lose that game last week with Penrith <laughs> having their five origin stars out. Uh, Penrith rested those players and he's just slipped that in the press conference. So I think he's fired them up there. And look, Melbourne came out and they scored the first and second tries, as he said. The second one, I think, was to... Big Nelson and Sofa Solomona and a bit of that a controversial one. He was always one. scoring that one. <laughs> was well, it was a little bit of a controversial one. Um, I think a lot of people thought it might have been a double movement. Um, it yeah, looked it pretty a, sketchy. Yeah, it was a really interesting one. Uh, 
Yeah, look, I, th- I thought he was going to get the try taken off him, to be honest. Um, yeah, I thought Lachlan Coot was on him when he looked like he got up and had another go. And not Lachlan Coot. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah, Duh. but um, Edwards, I thought Edwards, Edwards was yeah. on him because he kind of like bounced in the tackle. I've gone, surely that's held. And he's reached out and had another go. Like, oh, there's enough momentum and there. I, think I don't know. There was a player who came over the top as well, I think, and... and... Dislodged the ball as well, but um, he got he got that try. So they got off to that quick little lead there. I think it was fourteen nil, and then yeah, um, as you said, the Panthers just clicked in the gear, and Isaac Tungo he really fired up, and he uh, he had probably one of the best games of his career. He, he bumped off, I think, Will Warbrick in the second half to score a great try. He's uh, just. Will's just come out of the line to put a big shot on him and Isaac's just bumped him off. Um, and after that, I think Will's gone off for a HIA and I'm not too sure if he came back, to be honest, but um, <laughs> he's got uh, Isaac just stepped inside and just scored a try. So, no, nah, he, he had a great game, Isaac. As I said, probably the best game he's had of his career. Um, and... The Panthers just ran away with it. They they showed their experience in big games, and this was a big game, a bit of an arch rival to the Panthers, the Storm, and um, they wanted to get the win. And as you said, Jack Hogger, he's really uh, slotted into this side. Um, it, look, he's nothing fancy, but he does his job. He does his tackles, he does his kicks, and he runs that side around with Jerome Luai and uh, whilst Nathan Cleary's um, out, I think... I think the Panthers have won all their games, I think, with uh, Jack Cogger yeah. at half. So, no, nah, he's he's doing a good job and um, he's been at a couple of clubs now, so he's getting a little bit of a run. Obviously, he's going to be behind Nathan Cleary, uh, but it's a good backup to have. Yeah. So do you think Newcastle made a big mistake by letting him go? Because they said his surplus to requirements, like they must be looking at something different to what I'm looking at because um, – yeah, Jack Cogger's playing in teams going forward and all that sort of stuff. So he has a different sort of role in Penrith. He's not in a team that's getting beaten every week all the time. But you don't go from being average to being a star. Like, he was good then, and he's fairly good now. And I think he's still getting the same job done. So, yeah, um, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I mean, if a club is losing games considerably, well, then you're most likely probably going to look at your halves and you probably need something else to do. But as you said, it doesn't happen overnight. And um, getting into a better system, obviously Penrith have been the champions the last couple of years and uh, especially last year, they won every single grade that was on offer. And yeah, just getting into that Penrith system has really, he's developed into a, a good first grade, a good solid first grader. And he wasn't like that at, at Newcastle. Now, I think he's played like nearly 50 games now too, pretty close to that. So uh, he's been playing for a few years and it's good, good to see him get up there. And yeah, he gets a bit of success with Penrith and he'll be in the spot. He'll be probably similar to Sean O'Sullivan, what he was like last year with us and uh, fill, fill in well So and be used when required. Uh, so yeah, that bug of my tips has to I only have one hour of three <laughs> yeah, so far of them games. Yeah, uh, well, I was, I, was, I was the same. I was the same. Yeah, I was the same one out of three zero on Friday night, so it crueled me for the weekend. <laughs> so Raiders against the Titans. I tipped the Raiders, but I honestly thought the Titans might be able to get this one done too. This was a bit hard to tip. Um and I went for the Raiders purely because I was going, they're they're gonna have it their favour because they're playing in Canberra. This is gonna be a lot better than what uh it could potentially be. But um yeah, the Titans, the Titans stepped up. They've been playing really good lately. So I I think they look really infused that they know that Des Hasler's coming in. I think it's good for them. Yeah, well, it's certainly interesting now that um, Justin Holbrook is gone. They sacked him a couple of weeks ago. And again, the coaching curse struck again. The Titans got a win against the Broncos last week. So they were full of confidence. They They knew they could beat the top teams. Uh, so they were going into this game with a lot of confidence, thinking they could win this game. And they they really played well. Canberra, again, a team that is also playing some good footy this year as well. So they, I think they're in fifth position. So they're finding themselves in that 
top zone, nearly in the top four. So they've been probably maybe a little bit of a surprise packet this year. I mean, I don't think many people had them in the uh, top half of the top eight. Um, or they're just outside the top four, but um, their players are good footy and uh, they just got away with this win. There was obviously that controversial try, David Fafita, um, I think, pushing uh, Jamal Fogarty out of the way uh, to score a try. Many thought he might have been just offside. Uh, many thought that it just pushed him out of the way. But, um, look, he was, he was going for the ball. He was trying to get get to the ball. He was competing for the ball and um, got the try. But the Raiders, they got the win in the end. And maybe it was that hometown uh, crowd that got them home in the end. No, no, I think it was. So I definitely think it was. I think Ricky Stewart is uh, doing a good job again with Canberra. So they're going to be there or thereabouts. They're either going to just sort of make it in the eight this year again, like six, seven or eight, or just miss it. So th there's going to be teams like that this year. going to go, oh, if only had to won this game or that game. It will be the difference between being in the finals, not being in it this year. It really is that close. And there's going to be several teams in that boat. I don't think it'll just be one or two. So uh, let's wait with beta breath. I, I think both of them can make the top eight. Um, that means that someone that's there now is probably going to miss out. It wouldn't surprise me out of them two and the Warriors if uh, only one or two of them make it and one or two of them miss out. So it, it, I think that'll be, they'll be around the bottom end of that uh, top eight there. So we'll see what happens as we kick on. So the, <laughs> the next game is touch football at its finest. So the Cowboys so said they went crashing to earth the other week uh, when they got smashed by the Tigers. How did this happen? 74-0 oh. for the Cowboys, for anyone that doesn't know. they like, It's the third highest score yeah. rugby league uh, all time. The two highest ones before that, uh, St. George against Canterbury in 1935 uh, was 91-6. to six, And uh, then 87-7 seven was St. George against the Roosters. Oh, sorry, no, that was the Roosters against Canterbury in 1935 as well. That was the year when Dave Brown scored 38 tries, and, and that one's come within 10 tries of that. But um, 74 nil. So the big scores in, back in the day were unlimited tackle counts. This was not unlimited tackle counts. So when I was watching the game, I only watched a bit of it because it's coming from rugby. I thought the Cowboys put 100 on, to be honest with you, and I was surprised they didn't. Yeah, well... Uh... Previous, I think it was May, 20th of May, I think. Uh, I'm not too sure what round it was, but obviously the Tigers got the win 66 to 18 at Leichhardt Oval. and Round 12. Uh, <laughs> yeah, round 12, there you go. So only, what, six weeks ago they played each other and they had that score. So it was like a massive 140-something uh, yeah, point turnaround and... I think Spud Carroll on NRL 360 predicted that. I think he was looking forward to that. And he actually said that there's going to be like a 132-point turnaround or something like that. So he was he was right. He was on the money. He knew that the Cowboys were on. But, look, they just scored. Tommy Dearden scored the first try. And a couple of minutes later, the next try. And then the next try. And the next try. And it was, it was just like a, a yeah, touch football game, really. I mean, the Cowboys, they make a break through the middle and, and on the edges, and they just have so many players in support. And it was like, take your pick on the inside, outside. Val Holmes scored, I think, three. Murray Tuolagi scored a three as well. So, yeah, um, yeah, it was just embarrassing for the Tigers. And just watching, sitting there watching, I just thought, yeah, how high can this get? Um, I know the, the week before, the Eels played the Dolphins and – they got to 42 to four at half time, and this game was looking like that as well. But they got more, more than that, and um, they went on with it. And uh, the poor old Tigers, um, I don't know where you go from that. I think Alex Twelve got a suspension for a hip drop tackle, so he served 10 minutes in the bin. So he's gone from the highest of high scoring a try. His first ever NRL try to be in Sinbin and then suspended. So, um, yeah, I, I honestly don't know what's going on at the Tigers and how do they recover from this. So I heard I heard on Daily Telegraph they put some stuff out the other day and they said part of the problem with the Tigers, um, 
So this came from who was it? Tony Adams said that um it was at a function in Christmas last year. So he had someone that was at a function last year at Christmas and the West Tigers people or West Tigers function. The West people are in one corner bagging out Balmain. The Balmain people are in the other corner doing the yeah. same thing. The newer guys had dropped in between that were all there and it was like three divided clubs in one. That's crap. You cannot do that. They've got, they got to let that go. If they don't let that go, they may as well relocate the club. In my honest opinion, I said a few years ago before all this was happening, I actually think the NRL should have streamlined a little bit and probably merged West Tigers with Canterbury and have a big southwest area of Sydney as one area and probably even look at merging St. George Illawarra and Cronulla to have another big south area as well, like dedicated to two sides and like dedicated resources and stuff. So that would be smart. But what's happening now is ripping the place to pieces. So that's not helping at all. Yeah, no, like Sir George, they've got a lot of dramas off the field as well. Um, they've had they've brought in Scott Fulton without the coach, Jim Sheens, and Benji Marshall knowing about that to become their recruitment manager. Um, they've obviously lost Luke Brooks um, last week to Manly for next year. Um, I think it was like Benji wanted to keep Luke Brooks there um, and... Obviously, now he's gone to Manly, so they've got dramas there. Um, I'm not 100% sure about this whole coaching situation. I mean, you've got Benji and Robbie as assistants, and you've got Tim as head coach. There's been talk that maybe Benji might take over as head coach next year. Um, yeah. So there's been talk about a rift between Tim Sheens and Benji Marshall. Benji's come out and squashed that. Uh, but you just don't know what's going on. And as I said, too many dramas off field and it's reflecting on field. So, See, and... in, in, in my opinion, they need a Wayne Bennett style coach. They need an experienced guy who hasn't been at the club before, like Tim Sheens was when he first went there. They got to get someone from outside the club. Cameron Serraldo would have been good because he had actually Cameron Serraldo would have been bad because he actually played for, West before, if I'm right. I think he played juniors with West or something. So um, get they've got to get an external person to come in and coach and just go, this is what I need to do, this is what I've got to do, and just clean clean it out. They've got to get new board members. I don't know how they do that. They've got to get people that are not associated with West or Balmain. Like Balmain, the Legs Club doesn't exist anymore at all. Like, it's gone. Uh, West's... The, but the whole power struggle is just wrecking that place massively. I, I don't know how you fix it. I do think Tim Sheens would be under pressure if um, West had... Well, how can you guarantee Benji Marshall and Robbie Farrad are going to get the coaching job going forward? Because they're inexperienced and they're getting smashed. So that they're, they're not... I hope they turn it around, but I'm not confident about that. You've got to get someone else to come in. Like even... Um, Tony Smith, like Brian Smith's brother, might be a good option. Get someone that's experienced, that knows what they're doing, that's got runs on the board, and maybe even done it in the UK. Get them to come over and do it, so and run the place. Yeah, I think maybe maybe what they should have done is just go on with Benji and Robbie at the start of the year, and just have Tim Sheens oversee it um, as as an assistant coach, um, assistant coach, general manager sort of type role. Um, but yeah. let ben even though Benji and Robbie are inexperienced, obviously they were trying to do with Tim being the coach and Benji and Robbie get that experience. So obviously they were trying to get the experience that way, but um, it's not working for them. As you said, there's too much uh, board fighting, infighting with, with Wes and with Balmain. So um, they Wes have got all the money, Balmain don't have all, all the money. Um, they haven't made finals in 11, 12 years or something like that. Um, yeah, they so need that's... another Gareth Ellis. They need to Gareth Ellis. Last time they had Gareth Ellis there, it's the last time they're in the finals. That's the last time they look like they were a serious threat that had comp, and they haven't got that forward. They need a well, Gareth got, Ellis, Steve, Stephen got, King, um, or something like that. Yeah, they got Isaiah Papali from Parramatta, and they thought maybe that could help them on those edges. Uh, obviously. Papa made the grand final with Parramatta last year and had a yeah. wow of a season the previous two years. So 
They got I, him I just to think the they need more. He's good, but they they need more. They don't have enough depth. They need a couple of extra big guys, like when Penrith picked up Peter Kelly and that back in the eighties. Uh, they need to do something radical like that. They need to get a couple of good playmakers. They need like an Adam Reynolds style player, to be honest with you as well. Of where you get him from, I don't know. So, yeah, you're just going to find it hard to attract players to go to go to the Tigers and not pay overs for them. Yeah. Yeah, that well, that'll be the problem. So, and even some of the good young players have got the Dane Laurie hasn't been playing good, but there's already clubs like Penrith looking at maybe picking him up again. So, the clubs looking at him. So, the Tigers will let him go. He's not playing flash for them, and he will play good again for someone else because he's a good quality player. He just needs extra good players around him. So, um, where, where I don't know, where do you start? Either they try to find old guys at the end of their career and pay them up to sling it out for a couple of years or they need to go the other way and uh, try to find some Isaiah Katoas like what the Dolphins did. So find some guys on the rise now that are in good systems like Pemriff Parramatta and doing well. Like Pemriff can't hold on to everybody. So surely it's a pretty big chance that you go to Pemriff and get a couple of players and you probably want to get a couple. You're going to add to the guys you've got like uh, Coruscant and that now and, and help bolster that. They've, They've just lost Luke Brooks, so they've lost a playmaker. I think Adam Dewey's a good guy to keep and they can build stuff with Adam Dewey, but Adam Dewey's not an Andrew Johns or anything. He's not going to do that much stuff. Uh, so you've got to keep bolstering that. It's, they're they're going to struggle now. I actually think if someone comes last and it's not the Dragons, I actually think it might be the Tigers again now. Yeah, that, I think that's going to really kick the wind out of their sail, that one. I think those two clubs play each other in a couple of weeks, so that'll be a an interesting game, and that could be a, a battle for the spoon. Yeah, it well, might well be. Uh, the next game, this was a good game. So Broncos up against the Dolphins. So at uh, Sand Corp again, and Broncos got up again. So um, and they're ripping in again, saying the Dolphins <laughs> doing all the fins out thing to the Dolphins. It's pretty funny, really. And Dolphins just going to have to wear it. They're going to be the little brother to the Broncos for a while. Um, they're building, they're going in the right direction. They're up around the eight as well, but they're, they're either just going to make it to or just miss out as well. Top eight this year, I think. So they really do need to be able to win games like that if they're going to make the top eight because that was a good opportunity this weekend. Yeah, well, the first time these two teams played, it was a sellout at uh, Suncorp Stadium and uh, the Broncos just got the win there with Katoni Stag scoring that length of the field try and uh, this game was played at the Gabba, so the first time because of the Women's World Soccer Cup, uh, it's currently happening for the next, I think, five to six weeks. Um, they've moved Brisbane home games to the Gabba, so first time a rugby league game has been played there since the 50s or 60s, uh, when Australia played Great Britain, I think it was. Uh, first ever NRL game there. Yeah. Like Richard uh, Benard say, marvellous stuff. Yes, yes. Well, um, look, a lot of people, a lot of people first thought that the viewing wouldn't be too good, being around uh, rugby league being played on a round field. But I spoke to a lot of people who went to that game, and they said that the views aren't too bad actually uh, for spectators. So that's one thing that they got right. It was again another full house. I think it was thirty odd thousand there. Um, but the Dolphins they stepped up. I mean, as I said, they got that first half. Uh, smashing against Parramatta the week before, 42-4. to uh, Ended up losing that game 48-20, I think it was. But they wanted to come back out against the Broncos, their big brothers, and um, they wanted to get this win. And it was pretty much a ding-dong affair. Like, the Broncos had scored, and uh, they scored a couple of tries, and the Dolphins had come back. And at one stage, it was 16-all, and you thought, oh, maybe the Dolphins might just jag this Jag this game. Um, Herbie Farnworth, he scored a couple of good tries in the first half. Um, and you thought maybe the Broncos are going to run away with this. But the Dolphins, they came back and uh, and then uh, Sel and Cobbo broke their hearts with a great individual try. Um, there was an offload, I think, from Contoti Staggs and sort of went behind him and he's turned around and he's put a kick through and ran around. I think it was Sean O'Sullivan and... Um, scored the try. It was, it was one of those tries that you're going to see on highlights reels for years to come. And 
Uh, it was a great try, and Brisbane ended up winning the game 24-16. Yeah, so they've definitely got all the quality there and uh, haven't dropped off yet either. Last year, this was about the time when the Broncos dropped off. Uh, I think Reynolds got injured about the same time, and that didn't help either. And, uh, yeah, they, they dropped off and dropped from being second in the comp. I think they were second in the comp then, too, actually, uh, to not even – I don't even think they made the top eight at all, if I remember right. Uh, no, they, they fell out of the top eight, uh, didn't make it. So they'll be sort of not thinking about that, but thinking about that, about what happened last year. Uh, they're in a bit better position this year, having one more game. So they've still got, I think, two buys to go. Um, so they're, they're sitting in a nice position up there in the top of the ladder. Um, but they're sort of playing a different type, type of football this year, I think. And as you said, Reynolds injured last year. I think uh, Pat Carrigan got suspended last year for a hip drop tackle on, I think it was Jackson Hastings when he was playing at the Tigers. So he was out for, I think, six weeks or so. Uh, so they missed him at the back end of last year, but he's there playing some great footy. And yeah, they're a different side. So uh, they're, they're traveling along quite nicely at the moment, the Brisbane Broncos. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I definitely think they're going to be in the top four if they can avoid any injuries. So if he's heading into the back end of the comp, they do that, they should finish in the top four pretty comfortably at the moment. So uh, they'll be happy with it where they're sitting there in Melbourne and Penrith too. Uh, so the next slide, so we talk about how the Dragons and uh, West Tigers are doing their best, like having whole more beer moments. Well, the Bulldogs, they took it up a level on the weekend too. I don't know, I don't know where to gauge them at the moment. <laughs> they got smoked 66 nil to the Knights at home too. Like that's a terrible result. Um, really thought they would have done a lot better. Cameron Serraldo, I see pressure is getting to him now. He just told people, just pull your head in and just don't worry about it. If you're not you're not going to back us, don't say anything at all. Like you've got to get over it a little bit. So you're going to be criticised. And I don't know. Cameron Serraldo, I do think he's a better coach than Trent Barrett. But I'm not sure that the Bulldogs have gone much further for this year than last year, other than they've got a couple of extra players. Yeah, well, at the start of the year, they were playing some good footy and they were winning games. And now they've had a few injuries. I think Billy Army Kickow is has been out for a long time, one of their prize signings. Uh, next year, I think they've got Stephen Crichton coming along to the club. Um, so they've got some semi decent players there. Um, even at the moment, I mean, they've got, you know, Addo Carr, who's been struggling in origin, but um, he obviously had that injury a few weeks ago. Um, Matty Burton uh, has been playing some good footy. But, yeah, they, they just really struggled yesterday against the Knights. And, again, it was like a training run. Caelan Ponga, he was on fire. Didn't score a try, but I think he kicked 11 goals, um, all, all 11 goals which I think equaled Andrew Johns's club record um, of uh, points in a game and or goals in a game. Um, and, but, yeah, he was just running the team around perfectly and finding those gaps. And the same thing, once they made a break through the, through the middle or on the edge, there was always that support left and right. And uh, they wanted to get on the try-scoring list. And it just, yeah, really blew out. Um I think it was 30 nil at half time, um, and that ended up being 36 nil at half, uh, full time. Um, so another, they added another 36 points. So um, both clubs under a lot of pressure. Adam O'Brien's under a lot of pressure up there at Newcastle, so he needed this win. And uh, he's still under a lot of pressure because it was only the Bulldogs that they played. And um, yeah, the Bulldogs they might be in a in a three-way for that wooden spoon of the Dragons and the Tigers. Well, they're trying to steal defeat, clutch defeat from the jaws of victory. So um, they just should be doing a lot better than what they are. So it's hard to say they've improved from last year because last year they didn't have much and they got a fair bit out of it. So And after Barrett got the flick, I still think that they got a bit out of it after that as well. So whereas... Now this year, I'm I don't know. I haven't seen the massive improvements there. So I think they should have kept Mick Potter on. I think they made a mistake there by letting him go. 
Maybe Mick Potter, maybe, maybe West Tigers need to get him back. So that's how you turn things around. Get him involved in it. He's been there before. He knows what he's doing. Um, he did it with Bulldogs last year. Helped turn them around. He might be able to do the same thing West Tigers again. So maybe he's the guy because he's still fairly current, been coaching certain more recent than Tim Sheens. And Tim Sheens is getting to the back end of his stuff. But uh, Bulldogs now, yeah, well, they've got Steve Crichton next year. So they've got the quality there. Uh, but you lose a couple of big players, even when you've got a couple of big name players. So you lose in them to injuries like kick out and that stuff. <laughs> you're building your season around the guy. So you're going to have problems because you're not going to have two kick outs in the team. Uh, suppose they've got to try to find who are the guys coming through the club. They're going to be able to uh, complement these extra guys when they're there because they really need to have those guys step up a bit more. Reed, Reed Marnie saying that has been good. Uh, Hayes Perham, aren't they going to flick him or something? they it sound like they're uh, going to spear him or something. Yeah, I think there was talk that he can look around for another club. Um, yeah, it's a tough tough club to be at if you're not playing well and not winning games. And you certainly be a look at. I mean, the the two centres as well. Um, Jake Avarillo, he signed with the Dolphins for next year. Uh, Paul Amalot, Amalotti, um, he's been... He's been said that uh, you can look for another club as well. So, I mean, that's obviously not going to give you any confidence being a player on the team, being told that you want to um, – it can go either way. You know, you could either be a star and perform and then pick up another contract somewhere else or it could really be a bit deflating and just um, your performance isn't going to be there. So, they've got Stephen Crichton going there next year. They've got, I think, Bronson Cherry as well after his suspension. Yeah. Uh, I think He'll he's be going there as well. Yeah. He'll be a good pickup as well because I reckon he'll hit the ground running and really step up with maturity after being done for the drug ban and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, he'll he'll want to he'll want to yeah, as you yeah. said, hit the ground running and get r- right into it. Um, hopefully, kick out will be back for them as well. Um, and yeah, they just want to improve on this year. Yeah. I I just can't understand right because I watched the game when they played against the Roosters the other week and they took it all away. To the bell with the Roosters. It took the Roosters that kicked the field goal or something yeah. the end to win it. Uh, trying to think who did that. Kiri kicked the field goal, I think it was, and got them 21 20 or whatever it was. It, it was close. And um, I'm just surprised they do that like three, literally like three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and then roll out and do that. And yesterday, like, wow, just surprised me because I've I thought they have more on the line and they've got more talent than that. They do have the talent, uh, but uh, they're inconsistent. So, yeah, they've got to bring a couple more guys in still. And the, when uh, Phil Gould came in through, Bill Penrith said it was a five-year project. And he, he literally cleaned out, upset Penrith fans too, got rid of Luke Lewis and Jennings and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, why would you get rid of some of these guys? And then you've just got to. you got too much talent coming through not to. Uh, I think maybe the Bill Dogs have got some guys that are coming through as well that are decent players. They've got some decent lower-grade squads. And, yeah, yeah got to, can't keep everyone. And it's, if the guys aren't aiming up now and they're not doing that well, we may as well release the blokes. Otherwise, you, can't, you have 50 people and only half of them are playing. So some guys get money and probably can use towards other players. Yeah, well, Gus has got his... Uh... Five-year plan, no doubt. And just have to wait and see how that goes. <laughs> Might be a seven or eight-year plan. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Don't turn around. Uh, then, so the next day, that killed me on the tips as well. And uh, <laughs> the next one, too, didn't do me any favours either. The Seagulls, when Tom Travojevic blew out his hamstring, <laughs> I scratched him for the rest of the season. Went, you're done. <laughs> They're done. And they turn out against the Roosters. I'm telling you, the Roosters... They're, they're all over the place as well. <laughs> like I picked them as competition favourites at the start of the year, thinking they genuinely had a good chance to win the comp. And they went down 18-16 yesterday to <laughs> Manly. So Manly's aimed up well. And uh, as a result, well, Jake Trebojevic is back in the origin side. And the Roosters, I don't know. I don't know. Ever since Joseph, Joseph Suolati um, announced that he's going to rugby union, that's when the wheels fell off their bus. And it doesn't look like it's got better since. Yeah, well, he was missing yesterday through injury, and um, Jake came back from Jake Travoyevich came back from Manly from injury, so it was his first game back in a long time. 
And, um, yeah, the Roosters, they had been struggling the last few weeks. Um, obviously, Sam Walker's been out injured for a long time. Um, and they're missing that half. They've got Sam Smith in there now. who d- did a pretty reasonable job yesterday. Uh, put some good kicks in and um, that led to tries. But um, James Tedesco, we all know he's been struggling uh, for form. And I think he's even admitted it that, uh, he's not playing the best football that he can play at the moment. I think he said that he's struggling a little bit and he wants to try and turn that around. Uh, we all seen that in Origin uh, 1 and 2. Um, hoping he can turn that around in Origin 3 so it's not a whitewash. But, uh, look, the Roosters, they scored first and then Mealy scored, then the Roosters scored, then Mealy scored. So it was going, it was going either way. Uh, this game and Daly Cherry Evans, he got an intercept try. He scored two tries during the game, so his kicking game really helped Manly. They were uh, um, the Roosters. They made r- more run meters in the game, but um, Daly's kicking game kept Manly in the game. So when they were pegged back down their end, he just boot the ball out of out of their end. And um, look, it was it was I think. Um, it was going to be anybody's game going into the last 10 minutes. And then the other Turbo brother, Ben, who came back from injury as well, he scored the, well, yeah, the match-winning try. And um, the Sea Eagles held on to win 18-16 in front of a sold-out um, Four Pines Park crowd. They would have been pumping up there too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's good. It's a good win, and uh, anytime you get up, they like getting it up over the Roosters too. So everyone calls them the Silver Tails. They celebrate pretty hard when they get the wins, and uh, that place go off. If, if you lost, you're going to get a mouthful of crap from Manly if you're in the crowd. I can tell you. Yeah. Uh, Again, I think the crowd wins. got them back, um, back into the contest as well. So um, it just shows you how crucial home ground advantage is. If you can get that crowd on on side. Unlike the Bulldogs crowd at their game, if you can get them, if you can get your crowd on side, then uh, they can really help you and lift you in the game, and um, hopefully inspire you to do something and you know score points, score tries, and win the game. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we'll have a look at the table now. So the table looks like it's got Panthers on top after sixteen matches with twenty six points. Uh, the Broncos are second, uh, seventeen games, twenty six points. Uh, Panthers have a. So Panthers, some one of these sides has a buy in the next couple of weeks again, I think. So uh, Sharks on uh, third place on 24 points, they have 15 games there. So they have, I think they've had both their buyers now. Uh, got the Storm, 16 games, 24. Uh, Raiders in fifth. So, yeah, hey, that's a little bit of a surprise draft off the bat. I didn't realise the Raiders were doing so well. I thought they were about eighth or ninth. Uh, so fifth place there on 24 points. Eels sec, uh, sixth on 22. Uh, Rabbitohs. Uh, seven from 22, they played 17 games, but Warriors 8th, 22, uh, Cowboys 9th, 20, and Titans 10th. So they've only played 15 games on 20 points. So they could actually well and truly make it. So when they get the games in hand, they get two wins there. Next thing you know, they could actually find themselves up around probably four, fifth, six if they can get two wins. So we're relying on getting two wins, but like, yeah, it could, they could get themselves right up there or they'll still be sitting down about the same. Uh, Seagulls sitting in 11th at the moment, 19 points, 16 games. Uh, the Dolphins, 16 games, 18 points in 12th. So they could get up there. I, I think they're just going to miss it. The, as the longer the season goes on, they'll be pretty close. They'll be happy with their first year. I think they're probably just going to get on the fringe of the eight and just miss it. Ninth, tenth, something like that. Finish that, they'll be happy. They'll say they're disappointed, and they probably will be because they could do more. They're probably just going to miss it. The Roosters, I I don't know if they can make it from the finals to the finals now. They've got the quality of players to do it. I just think they're way out of form. Um, I can't see what's going to change that. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> minus 92 point differential doesn't help and sitting in 13 from 18 points. So they're the best of the bottom half of the comp. They could easily get in the top eight. So because if someone could pull eight wins in a trot, well, my money would be on them to do that. So that would eight wins to get them up to 34 points. They'd make the top, they'd nearly be in the top four if they get 34, but I don't think they will. Uh, 
The Knights are there in 14th on 17 points. So they're going to probably finish about where they are now. I I reckon that their coach is in trouble next year, Adam O'Brien. So I would probably be penciling him in for the first person to get the sack next year. So I know it's pretty nasty to have to list someone, but one of the coaches will get it. Uh Unfortunately, I think he'll be the guy. And uh, what's Tim Machine's plans next year? If he stays with West <laughs> Tigers, if I don't, if I don't flick him this year, he'll be gone next year. If they if they start off the same they do this year, they're going to have problems. He won't last out, so he won't even get to round ten. I reckon they'll give him a while, and they'll just go, mate. You got to hand the reins over now, so they'll move out upon him faster. Uh, Bulldogs, yeah, 15, 14 points. So they're really. I actually don't think they're doing as well as they were last season. They've been competitive in probably another four or five games. They, they could be on nearly 24 points as well, but a near loss is still a loss at the end of the yeah. day. And that's what people are looking at. The Dragons, really, I think the Dragons have shown probably they're consistently the weakest side, but the Tigers, they've found some dumb ways to lose games. So, And when, when they've lost some games, they've copped some big spankings. And they don't score many points. So when they win games, they haven't beaten anybody like 40 to 10 or anything like that. So I'd be a bit alarmed at the moment for West Tigers fans. So they're going to have a big rebuild coming up next year, I think. Yeah, look, it's a very congested uh, top eight uh, in this competition. Most teams have had two buys uh, throughout the season. Uh, only the Broncos, Cowboys and Rabbitohs and uh, they've only had one buy. So they've still got four points that they need to add to their tally. So that could change massively that table um, in that time with those buy points added, uh, especially for the Cowboys who've only had one buy. So they are still got another four points. So you put yep. them on four points and they're, they're sitting in fifth position. So they could be the dark horse of the competition once they get into that eight. So... You, you would probably think that anyone from the Knights in 14th down, no good, can't make it. Yep. The Roosters and Dolphins are going to struggle. Um, same with the Sea Eagles. So they're pretty much on grand finals every week. They need to win all their games. Um, they've still got a buy in hand. Uh, the Titans and the Cowboys, again, they're, they're just there. The Titans have had all their buys, so no more extra points for them. This year, so they'll have to win all their games to get in the top eight. So um, it's really congested. And as you said, to score points, your four and against is so crucial. Um, you obviously want to be in the positive. You don't want to be in the negative. If you can put a score on a team, then you want to do that just to get that um, four and against up. So yeah, I think... I think only at this point in time, early out, I think only the Cowboys will probably be the only other team that can probably force themselves into the top eight. So I just don't know which order that the top eight will finish in. Yeah, I, I can't see. The only way Titans will make it, Titans need to win at least 60% of their game. So anyone outside the top eight need to win more than their, like way more than 50%. If you're winning 50%, you're missing out. You need to win... 60 70 percent or you're going to miss out so and then you need to rely on someone else to have a bad form slump and drop a few games here or there and i think all the teams in the top eight are going to drop a couple of games including Penrith, including the broncos that everyone will just be hoping they don't go on like a four or five game losing streak or you're going to be on the verge of not making it yeah well i mean myself being a Parramatta fan i know that we play we play the warriors this weekend, we've got to play the Storm, we've got to play the Broncos, and we're going to play the Panthers in coming weeks and the Cowboys as well. So they're all in and around Parramatta. So um, that's yeah. just one example of, of how you can go up and how you can go down if yeah. you don't win, win your games. The pa Parramatta's the best thing they've got going for them, man. Parramatta Pamer forgot the lead and differential, and Parramatta's the second best at the moment. So that's a pretty strong position to be in. Uh, I think Canberra's the only side in the top eight, not looking at the table at the moment, but I think they were the only side in the top eight with a negative, negative differential. Negative, yeah, so that's, 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 not, a big... that's not a good position to be in if it gets close because you're yeah. probably going to miss out. If they came equal on points with, let's say, ninth place, whoever that is, you're you're going to have issues. So um, I don't I don't think it's going to get that close for them. I think they'll, they'll either finish sixth or seventh or they might finish eighth. 
or they're going to finish ninth and miss it by wins. If, if it gets down to differential, they're going to have problems. Uh, so we'll look at the state of origin side anyway. So New South Wales, the team got confirmed. So <laughs> I'll run through it now. James Tedesco, number one and captain again. And we'll talk about <laughs> what we think after I run through it. Brian Toto, two. Uh, Stephen Crichton, three. Bradman Best, four. So he's making his debut. Josh Adokar, five. Cody Walker, six. Makes a comeback to origin. And probably well-deserved, too, actually. Mitchell Moses keeps his spot at seven. Jake Tabojevic, eight. He comes back in the squad. Damian Cook back starting uh, 13 again into nine. Regan Campbell-Gillard picked again, finally gets back in. So probably well-deserved, too. Uh, Liam Martin, 11. Uh, can't pronounce it. Kalamatungi's first name. Ken Kalamatungi, is that his name? So for South Yeah, Sky. Keon. Yeah, he's a 12. Uh, Cameron Murray in 13. So... Probably overdue as well. Now, Isaiah Yo, interestingly enough, is dropped on the bench. So I don't know how they're going to play his role if he's going to play off the bench. So maybe they're looking at uh, Kalamatungi, how he's going to go through the game or something. Jacob Saifidi's in the 15. Uh, Reese Robson, so he played a good game in the second game. So he's going to keep spot there. So not starting, but he'll be on the bench. So not a bad call. In 16, Clint Gufson, 17. He's got drink water, 18. So that's the only and uh, Spencer Lenu into nineteen there. So that's the only surprise really is Scott Drinkwater, but he's been playing good for a fair while. So I suppose he's made a, a decent claim over the last couple of years, as opposed to a couple of matches. And I don't know, but it feels like Brad Fitler is panicking and he didn't know exactly what to do. So he's picked the side to try to patch gaps now, and it's hard to tell if he's trying to save his job or he's like having an each way bet to try to get the win and maybe build for the future because it's a bit hard to get a read on that because Bradman Best looks like you're building for the future. Uh, same as like picking Cody Walker looks like in their desperate win now you're going to get sacked. So yeah, it's a it's a decent New South Wales side I suppose. Uh, Tedesco is question marks around him, but you can see obviously got Tedesco there and then you got Gufson in seventeen. So. I can't see Gufson sitting on the bench. So, and if he is, he won't sit on the bench for very long, I don't think. Yeah, look, I think um, personally, I think this might be Tedesco's last game in blue. Um, I think now that the series, it can go either way. He'll either retire from rep footy after this game because he's won everything. He's won World Cups. He's won Origin Series. He's won Premierships. He, he may retire from rep footy and just want to concentrate on the Roosters um, or he'll want to come back next year and try and redeem this year. Um, I think I think maybe Gutho's uh, selection there on the bench is, a, is an interesting one. I think maybe because of last game with Tom Travoyevich going down very early, um, they didn't have a recognised centre to uh, take that spot. Although Gutho is not a centre, he did play State of Origin in that position in 2020, I think it was. So he has a little bit of experience there. He can also cover a little bit of the halves as well. Um, a five-eight fullback, uh, centre, wing, if need be. Um, so yeah, look, Cody Walker, I think, is a very interesting one. I think if you're Wanting to build for the future, although Cody's been playing some great footy this year for South, um, then this might be a swan song game for him. Um, unless he's playing great footy next year, they may select him in game one, but um, I'm not too sure. I, I think Nico Hines is very hard done by not to get that six position. He picked him in game one. He only played, I think, 11 minutes or so. Out of position. Um, <laughs> Yeah, out of position. Well, he had to come on for um, Tommy Travoyevich, didn't he, I think? So, um, oh, no, sorry, that was game two. Um, yeah, he oh, well, he was in the centres in game one, um, Nico. So, it was, uh, yeah, out of position. So, you put him in a 5'8 or halfback role and I think he'll, he'll perform. So, he, I think he's been probably a bit hard done by. Bradman Best is an interesting one. Um coming from a struggling Newcastle side that hasn't set the world on fire this year. He had a great game yesterday against the Bulldogs, scoring a couple of tries, but maybe that's a pick for the future. Um, but, they, I mean, you've got uh, – oh, 
Campbell Graham was un, unavailable for selection due to injury. Uh, he would have been the likely pick for that spot if he was fit. Um, some yeah, have mentioned surely, Bill, surely that's what you'd be thinking. Yeah, Campbell Graham would have been a walk up start for that. All the trail, there would have been about four guys ahead of him, and they weren't available. Yeah, I, I think um, a few people have mentioned Will Penasini from Parramatta. Uh, there's obviously Isaac Tungo from Penrith as well. Um, mm -hmm. Dylan Edwards is finding himself a bit harsh as well. I mean, a lot of people have said maybe he should have got the 17 instead of Clint Gutherson because he can cover fullback wing, probably centre as well, uh, maybe even 5'8 if need be. Um, so, again, he's one of the unlucky ones as well. So, um, look, it's an interesting side. Regan Campbell-Gillard comes back in, replaces his great mate, Junior Paolo, who got dropped. Um, and Colin Matungi makes his debut. So it's an interesting squad. Um, hopefully, it's going to be the team that um, wins game three so Queensland don't go 3-0 uh, up. Yeah, so I think Colin Matungi 100% deserves his spot. He's been playing good for South, and South has been playing good. Grab him best. I just wouldn't have picked him right for on a young guy in that uh, it's not... Look, he's not not in form. He's probably playing good. I just think there's more experienced options. I would have gone for more experienced option as opposed to dropping a freshie in to a game where New South Wales need to. But they don't want to lose 3-0. It's going to be tough if New South Wales are on the back foot. He's not going to do anything to be able to change that around. Well, the other person that was mentioned was Katoni Staggs as well. He had... Uh, I think he's played one or two games for New South Wales before. Yeah. So, obviously, the Broncos are right up there, top of the ladder, playing some great footy. He, he himself is playing some good football. So, he could probably find himself unlucky not to be picked. Yeah. So, I think part of New South Wales' problem they've got themselves in, too, is at the start of the year, and they did it last year, too, uh, we've been picking the best players available. So, we've picked a side with three or four fullbacks in it. And just grafted them all over the place. Latrell Mitchell, where he's normally a centre, has been playing fullback for Souths. So dropped him in the centres. Tom Trebojevic, he's a centre. Drop him, sorry, a fullback, drop him into the centres as well. Got Tedesco as fullback, drop him into the centres. And they've been trying to bastardise players into positions that's not their normal fit. And so we've got the best players. And now we've got this situation where I think we've created this ourselves and we've done it in the past as well trying to pick guys like Sean Timmons when he's playing lock and he's play centre for St. George Illawarra and that as well. All of a sudden pick him to play 5'8 because we want a tough defender. But I thought we want your 5'8 to be a running ball player. So that's yeah, it's what an goes interesting against one. everything they want to do. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Do you pick players in form in their position um, or do you just pick the best players? And I think back at game one, I think obviously they wanted the uh, best players rather than the players that were in form. I think Campbell Graham's a um, perfect example. Plays in the centres for South. Um, he's oh, played for God. Australia on the wing, but um, obviously they wanted Latrell and uh, Tommy Turbo in the centres. So, yeah, um, yeah it's I, an interesting I one. actually think Cody Walker, so from my own opinion, the way he's played the last couple of years, He's probably good enough. He probably should have got the 5-8 spot in game one. It was a little bit of talk. Game three to pick him. So I think that's that's a tough chop. And I think they picked Luai because he's got the connection with Cleary. But both of them play either side of the ruck. So when I pick Cody Walker, the guy plays off the cuff, plays more off the cuff than what Jerome Luai does, but would have brought a different uh, mix to the whole game too. Yeah, well, there was a little bit of talk about that, especially for game two um, with Damien Cook being selected. And um, initially, initially Latrell Mitchell being picked as well, uh, but ruled out with injury. Um, and they were probably trying to look for that South connection like they had the Penrith connection, but um, it wasn't to be, even though they thought, you know, maybe Adam Reynolds might get the halfback position just for those connections. Uh -huh. But... Um, it wasn't to be. Yeah, there you go. Let's have a look at Queensland team. I've got that. Let's see if we can get that up as well now. 
Oh, here we go. So they've named our team as well. Let's see. I think uh, they're only... Yeah, only so change. number one. So this is a bit of a surprise too. Although he's playing good. AJ Brimson, the fullback. Xavier Coates in uh, wing and number two. So Valentine Holmes, number three. I would have dropped him after only kicking 11 out of 13. That other day was terrible kicking. So, <laughs> so the hammer in number four. So he's been playing good. So so far everyone's... Well, Queensland is picking players that are playing well, and the best people in their position and deserving their spots. Uh, Murray Tuolagi in five, uh, Cameron Munster six, Daly Cherry Evans seven, and the captain. So, so far, everyone deserves their spot. That's why they won the series. Ruben Cotter eight, Harry Grant nine, Tuno Fasua Malui uh, in 10, got uh, Fafita in 11 there, Jeremy Nanai 12. So, uh, I wonder if they could have got another option there, maybe. So, Patrick Carrigan, 13. Ben Hunt, the salary cap man, number 14. Lindsay Collins, 15. So, now, I thought Lindsay Collins got player in a match last game, didn't he? Uh, yeah, I think he did. Um, well, that might have been game one. Yeah. So, I would have thought he would have gone pretty close to the starting spot. But Queensland, Queensland's just more settled with that, right? Once they pick sides... Uh, they don't go, oh, we're going to turn this prop. We're going to turn Fafita into a 5 eighth now because we need to run and play out. They don't do that. Uh, and they've got uh, Fatuaka, whatever his name is. So he's in 16 there from the Titans there. Corey Hosbrough is uh, in the 17. Got Tom Dearden on the bench. And I can tell you, he must have gone close to being able to make that squad. He was very, very good the other night. And I think he's been good all year. And Jermaine Hopgood has been playing good for the Eels and he's in 19, again, 19 for me. And so uh, he's, I think he's been in it all season, hasn't he, so far this year? Jermaine, yeah, he's played yeah. all games for Parramatta and uh, he was a little bit talked about for game one. Um, obviously, didn't get selected for game one and two. So um, good to see him be in and around the camp uh, for Queensland. Um Hopefully he's allowed to play for Parramatta on the weekend because we're missing a few <laughs> this, this week. But um, uh, congratulations to Jermaine. Look, the Queenslanders, as you said, they had a pretty set side. The only changes they had to make were through injury and suspension. Obviously, Reese Walsh was suspended for three games. So AJ Brimson, I think, was 18th or 19th man in game two. So that was probably the logical choice. He's come in before and he's done the job for Queensland. Uh, previously, and Big Red, Corey Horsburgh, gets a spot on the bench. He was in and around the squad in game two as well. So, um, yeah, he gets his opportunity at uh, Queensland Origin Sport. The only, I think, the only Raiders player playing in game three. And I think an interesting say, I think the last seven, seven series, I think it is, um, the Raiders have always had one player, I think, playing in Origin in game three. Hey, that's interesting. That's an interesting fact altogether. So yeah, I didn't know that. And strangely enough, uh, a lot of the Canberra pl- Canberra Fords that have played in State of Origin have been ginger nut guys. So it was Sam Bacco, so look like a Viking and ginger hair. Uh, Corey Horsburgh, so ginger hair again. Something. Oh, you got uh, Queensland and uh, Synonymous is what Fatty Vorton, So. Yeah, he's going to get the head wobble going on. <laughs> maybe, maybe, but uh, he'll be fired up when he gets on the field, that's for sure. Yeah, there you go. All right, Troy, I'll let you go. Thanks for having a chat. Really appreciate it and I look forward to getting this out. So I'll get this up on YouTube a bit later on and everyone will be able to catch this on Pulse FM as well on uh, Friday night. We'll catch this on Weekend Sports Rappers, uh, sorry, on uh, Weekend Warriors on the podcast too. And we will chat again on Wednesday night if you're sweet for that one. Yeah, nah, look forward to it. And uh, preview, what is it, round 19. So it's slowly yeah. becoming towards the business end of the season. Absolutely. So looking forward to that. Uh, have a great night, Troy. And I'll catch you then. Thanks, Duck Man. See you, mate.